Wait. It's okay. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the conference. In fact, it's been a while since the last one, five years ago, as Christian said. Uh, I want to start just to thank Christian and all the crew for the big effort they do and to bring back this excellence conference. So thank you, Christian. And also has been one year since London XDC. So as for today, we want to announce, no, just kidding. I was checking if everyone is awake after the lunch. <laughs> Looks like it. But the truth is that since the last London XDC conference, we added like more than 50 new features just to the iOS framework and more than 70 book pieces for the iOS framework, what is good, I think, for everyone developing for that platform. So let's start with some changes in the deployment side of things. Most of them brought by Apple itself every time they decide to change things. So for example, now you can use as always for the IDE Mac OS 10 14 or even the newest Sonoma and Xcode 14 and or 15. And one of the big changes introduced in the last Soyo release is that we updated the iOS SDK to the last one, 70.2, what means, among other things, that you are going to need uh, X, the installation of Xcode 15.x for deployment on the device or to run and deploy with Xcode itself. The minimum version for iOS projects, both on iPhones or iPad, is iOS 11. And in fact, what you have to keep in mind, if you decide to install both Xcode 14 and 15 on the same computer, is just to make sure that you are using the right command line version for the Xcode, selected Xcode version you are using in the Mac. Because if there is a mismatch, then many problems can arise when you try to build, when you try to deploy or debug on the device, etc. Also, other consideration is if you have Xcode 15 installed, when you debug on the device, the device itself requires iOS 17 or later. So you cannot debug on any other device with a previous release of iOS. And also, as always, if you are using an Intel or M1 based Mac in this case, the minimum version for the simulator is 14.2 version. So this is important because from time to time we receive some issues from user related with not being able to debug on, on devices. And most of the times it is because they don't have the right command line tools selected on Xcode or because they don't have downloaded and installed the latest SDK release on Xcode itself or because they don't have install the right versions of the simulators. Other new features we did introduce some time ago since the LAX XDC conference is the ability to set the minimum iOS version you want to, to sell it for your apps. The minimum is iOS 11, but you can set any other value you want to. And also there is no need to select the team yourselves every time you create a new iOS project because it is selected by default if 
this or there is a team to be selected, what keeps it simpler to run the project on the device or on the simulator because it eliminates an extra step you, you need to do. And starting 1st of May, of May, Apple requires that any iOS apps submitted through the, for approval to the App Store could require a privacy manifest file always that such app makes certain calls to functions on certain APIs. And the truth is that the iOS framework itself falls into some of these categories because we internally do some calls to some of these APIs. So, for example, when using the folder item class, when using threads, or when we check for capitalization and local information, we fall into three these categories. And that means that currently, because of this, uh, our users are required to create manually this privacy manifest file. And that means that because the template for such resource only is available on Xcode 15, you are required to install Xcode 15 just to create this kind of template. This kind of template when using Xcode is very not easy to, to create because it is confusing based on a general XML editor and prone to, to make some errors just to include what is needed because we fall into those requirements. You can get more information about what <coughs> these privacy settings and categories means on the IPIs. On the Apple website itself, or you can just download the file if it gets ready someday based on the speed of the Wi-Fi. But the point, don't mind about this. The point, I, I think that Christian is going to distribute the presentations to everyone. We have published a blog post in the Soyo blog about how to create this kind of files step by step. But even if you don't want to create manually this kind of file, you can just click the link and download the, the file and just drag and drop in your iOS projects or add an extra copy file step so it is copied to the right path when you build the, the iOS app. And the good thing is that the starting Soyo 2024 release 2, we added our own editor to make it easier to create this kind of files and don't go and to Xcode or the need to install the last release of Xcode if you don't want to do it. And this is necessary not just because we fall into those categories, because if you use some declares or libraries or even plugins like the ones provided by Christian, and they do use these kind of calls, calls to the functions that are uh, grouped into these Apple requirements, then you need to create also this privacy file. So let's see how it looks. Oh, it is finished. <laughs> That's good. So as you can see here, this is the way Xcode offers to create and edit this kind of, of files. It is right here under the resources. Uh, and this is the, the template. 
And when you open this template, you are in front of this that is not that easy to use. So you need to add this entry and then create new privacy access API types. These ones are the ones required by, by ourselves. And if you are using some declares that fall into those categories from Apple or Christian uses some of those calls, you need to add a new entry on that new entry, add a new entry. Oh, no, because on Xcode, first you have to open the hierarchy for that new item, if you, I'm able to do it. And then, ah, now, declare the type, and then go here, and set the category, and then from here, uh, API type, and then, oh, so it's not the way to go. Very confusing. <coughs> so uh, starting with the new release of Soyo, we sim decide to simplify this. First of all, this is an internal 2024 release to ID build. So if you only use the iOS framework, you don't need to do anything. As soon as you build your iOS app, it compiles as is it usually does. This is because the internet connection not related with the speed of the ID compiling things. Okay, we can inspect the bundle. Ah, here it is. The privacy with the required keys for the categories and the reasons for every category. But if you do use declares or third parties plugins, you can go straight to the iOS compiling settings. And in the advanced settings, you can find the entitlements as it was the usual capabilities and the, the new edit for privacy ed editor. So right here, you can add new types, simpler, select the category, add new entries. The entries add filters just for this category. So you can add as many reasons as you need. Add new types. Because, for example, some declare requires the category related with this, ex this space, and then the reason for using that is this one. You close the editor, build the app, and then that new categories and reasons are merged with the ones we require for the iOS framework itself. So this time, when we inspect the bundle and open the privacy info file, we find our categories or reasons merged with your own reasons and categories. But because of that, you can also drag and drop privacy info files created from Xcode or provided by third parties, for example, because they require them. And when you drag and drop them over the editor, they are added and everything works as expected. And because probably many other projects you may create 
can require the same set of settings for the privacy info file, you can even export them, name them as you want to, save them as you want to save. So when you create a new project or a new IOS project, for example, you only have to go to the editor, drag and drop the file or open it and you are set. Easier and faster that Xcode itself offers to create this kind of privacy files. So what about the IS framework itself, about the new features we added since like last XDC? Well, the first thing, starting with the current release, are popovers. As you know, popovers are that little interface elements that are shown related with a parent control to display whatever you want to, to show to the user. Any control can be set on that popover. And you can use for that UI any screen, regular screen of the iOS project or any container control you create for that iOS project, a regular container control. So you decide if you want to display it as a popover or embed it in another view. One difference in popovers on iOS and desktop or web is that on popover on iOS, you can use as, part, as the parent control any mobile UI control and also any mobile toolbar button. What is very com convenient to show popovers <coughs> over or down that kind of controls. And as you can see here, <coughs> this is an extra parameter that is not found in the current release. So you will be able to decide if you want to show the popover with the animation and dismiss the popover with the animation or not. This is going to be available on iOS and also on desktop for popovers. So other, or another difference is that popovers make more sense when they are used on apps that are run on iPads because when that is the case, a popover is shown as expected, as a real popover. On iPhone, for example, popovers behave like regular model views, so it doesn't make a difference to use popovers or model views if you only are developing for iPhone. But it makes a lot of sense if you develop also for tablets. And in this case, you don't have the, the ability to decide if you want to show the popover over the source control, down the source control, at the left or the, or the right, because that kind of behavior on iOS is decided by the, by the iOS itself. On desktop or web, you have the control to decide if you want to show the popover in on any of the edge over the parent control is not the case on, on iOS. So the second big feature we added in the current release of Soyo is the barcode class. The barcode class both on iOS and MacOS relies on the native framework. So that means that you can scan or recognize uh, 12 or more than 12 different code types. And that also means that as soon Apple adds support for more code types, they will be available on your iOS and also, of course, on, on the macOS apps. With the functionality we provide through the barcode class that is the same on iOS, and desktop, you can create 
QR and barcode 128 type of codes as picture with the size, picture size you decide or you need. And you also can recognize any type of the supported codes from a picture you provide as the parameter. And also you can scan any code or supported code using, using the iPhone or the iPad camera. Of course, it is not possible to test the scanning of codes in the simulator because that is imposed by, a, by, by the <coughs> Apple simulator itself, but you can test on the simulator the creation a recognition of the barcode class. So creating a code is just one single line of code because it uses a shared method, barcode.image, the source, the string source you want to use, the size or target size you want to use for the picture and the type of code you want to create. You assign that to a picture and it is everything you need. And if you scan this code, <laughs> as you did, so your, so your rules, yeah. It's the same for scanning from an image. Barcode dot from image, you pass the picture as the parameter and you, it assigns to the variable as array, and you get any recognized uh, code it finds in the image. The variable in or it gives to you an array because an image can contain more than just one code and even different types of codes in the same image. Or it can't recognize any code at all, so it's always a good practice to check against nil or just to make sure that the variable, the array, has some value on it before trying to access any item. When it's about scanning from camera, everything you need is to drag and drop the class onto the screen, or even if you want to create a new instance from code, you can do it. And all you need to, to work is to call barcode, one in this case the name of the instance, dot start scan. Uh, it will present the user interface and everything you need to scan the codes. Of course, the really needed even handler you need to implement is a scan completed because this event is raised when the camera recognizes a uh, query or any of the supported types and gives as parameter the string with the code itself. Optionally, you can implement the scan failed and scan canceled event handlers just in case you want to get more control on what is going on. For example, if the user cancels, uh, giving the user interface away, you receive that action in the scan canceled event so you can, your app can react to that user action. And this is the user inter interface that is presented when you call barcode start scan. It's a regular view, so you can use the zoom gesture to adjust the image you want to scan, to center it on the camera focus, or have a better reference of the code you want to scan. And using the universal gesture of a sweeping, it gets the UI away. So let's see how it works through a quick demo. And for this one, in fact, I found a couple of good examples right here in the, in the conference. Hey. Okay. 
I found two good examples. The, the first one is this little bit squid you have in the table. And it's a good example because the code is really, really tiny. It's printed on a non-flat surface and even the kind of material is reflective. So it's a good code to test the functionality of the barcode scan. So let's run this up. This is the, the application you can find under example projects downloaded by the ID itself. So you can try it yourself. So let's do some zoom, and here, right away. And also, we implemented something called time silencing. Uh, let's zoom out just to make sure. Ah, OK, it is here. Time silencing means that when you try to scan some code, and it is scanned, it doesn't keep rising the event several times. As you did see, it is only raised one time. But if you keep focusing on the same co code right away of that silence time, because it means that it, it is on purpose that you, can, you want to read that same code several times, then zoom out. it keeps reading the same code. And the second good example I found right there, well, Alberto found it, is this one because the low contrast between the code itself and the background is not contrast at all. It's black over dark blue, so let's see. Oh, no problem. Just there, and you can, can keep reading. So no problem reading this kind of low contrast codes either. And of course, if we want to scan for an image, in this case, are they included in the example project? And you can see here all different kinds of types of codes you can recognize. These are, in fact, the most commonly used on any kind of industries. So you are covered. And of course, creating a code. It's really simple. Oh, you can switch to bar 128, and it's everything you need. One single line of code to create codes, recognize codes, or scan codes. Just one single line of code. And then other new feature we added is a PDF viewer control. We keep improving and adding new features to PDF document itself. So we receive a feature request from users about the need of providing a PDF viewer. With our PDF viewer control, the user is allowed to set the PDF file he wants to display set the viewer options for the main area of the PDF viewer, as if you want to display just one page in the view, two pages, or continuous displaying of the pages. And also decide if you want to display or not the thumbnails for the document itself. So if you decide to display the thumbnails, you can use that area of the viewer to move 
or scroll through the thumbnails, select the page you want to, to set on the main area of the viewer, etc. And because it's a native-based control, it also means that it supports all the actions that the iOS operating system provides for PDF documents themselves, uh, for opening links, uh, other intelligent actions as calling, copying, pasting, etc. Other feature that may be interesting for some kind of apps is that it also offers the option to retrieve all the text content from the PDF document that is shown in the viewer. So when you access the content property, you get as a string all the content of all the document. If it's a document with 100 pages, you get all the content so you can work with that text the way you want to. And also based on a feature request from our users, they ask us to provide, to provide a way to retrieve any of the pages of the PDF document as pictures. So we implemented that function. You have properties to set the page of the document you want to display in the main area. You can retrieve the number of pages of the document, so you can set it, get it, and retrieve that page as picture to do whatever you want to do. Here you can see how the PDF viewer looks like when added to a regular screen and it's shown in a Soyo app, in this case, on iPad. We did set, in this case, the viewer options to display two pages per view and also displaying the thumbnails area so you can scroll and see the thumbnails and select the page you want to, to see in the main area. And as you can see here, if it also provides an, a way to click and open links, any of the supported iOS links. And if you retrieve the content, this is what you get. In this case, case the text for the PDF we did see in the previous screen. Other control we updated based on feature requests from our users is a new property so you can set the URL to retrieve an image remotely. So that means that you don't have to add that kind of resources to the project itself, so smaller projects. And you can update the image you want to use any time you want to because it is based on the URL you provide and it is downloaded when the screen containing the image viewer is open. Other area we did improve are the iOS mobile table actions. This until now we had the regular ones when you slide in the rows to the left and now we provide the leading actions that are shown when you slide the rows to the right. And this kind of functionality is provided always you are using a data source what usually means that you are using your own custom cells to display as rows on the table. So here we can see at the right the regular action that can be attached to every custom cell in previous releases before 2023 and the new leading actions that can be attached to custom cells after 2023.2 or the three if I remember well. And this kind of actions work the same way. So the, e, the same event is raised for both of them and you uh, provide more functionality for the row based on these actions. 
Also, added geofencing to mobile location, and that means that you can create and assign a maximum of 20 regions per app. These regions are created through the mobile cir circular region class. That means that in the constructor and, or when you create the instance, you provide the latitude, longi longitude, and a unique identific identificator for the region itself. In this case, the app gets notified when the device enter or exit from any of the register regions, even if the app is executing in the background. Also requires enabling the location and background modes and provide the always usage, usage type to the request user authorization on the location instance itself. So for example, here we can see a snippet of code when we create where we create a mobile circular region providing the latitude, longitude, radius in meter for the, that circular region and the unique ID. Assigning it to a variable, we can set or decide if we want to get, be notified every time the device enter on the region, if we want to get notified or not when the device exit from that region and then add the region to the location instance. Of course, you have options to remove regions, or the regions, region by index, etc. But this kind of functionality is an active one because you have to create that mobile circular regions, add them, uh, and with a maximum of 20 regions per app, etc. But ah, we can see here an example when the device has exited from the defined region in this case for the Eiffel Tower. And this can be tested on the simulator in addition to the device itself. But kind of cousins to geofencing are visits. And visits is a good feature because you don't need to do anything more that set the visit awareness boolean to true in the mobile location instance. And everything else is managed by the IOS itself. All it does is to raise the visit changes event on the mobile location, but the operating system doesn't guarantee the immediate sending of the generate events. Also, doesn't guarantee that the enter or exit dates are valid, so are things you, you need to consider and check before trying to use them. Also requires enable the location and background modes capabilities. Visits are basically the way that the IOS provides to track the presence of the device during a certain amount of time on every location you are. So it's a good way to track where the device was during one day, two days, a week, a month, and in combination with the map location instances, you can combine that visits or, loca or location, mobile location instances with map locations to automatically add that visits to a map without writing a line of code. This is the that kind of functionality. So you get in the event, the arrival and departure dates. Once we check that they are not set to nil, they exist and are valid attributes, we create a new map location instance with that parameters and add 
that location to a map instance. And as a result, this is a, this shows a week of my weekly activity just carrying the iOS on my pocket and the app registered itself in background without any user interaction. All the spots or pins I've been during that time. So it's a very easy and very lower power consumption from the device point of view to track the user movements or keep it this kind of information. About maps themselves, we added the present event. So now it is possible for the user of your apps to add map pins themselves. That is something that was not possible in previous releases. Also added a couple of interesting methods. Distance too, so you can provide as parameter uh, other mobile location instance, and you get in kilometers the distance between two points or locations. And also the method points of interest. So when you provide a mobile location instance, it retrieves automatically all the points of interest he can find for that given place based on latitude and longitude. So for example, in this case, I dropped the pin near to Golden, Golden Gate. And you can see here some of the points of interest the app retrieved based on that pin location. And down at the left, the distance over the previous pin sitting on the top, in the other side of the bridge. In this case, 2.7 kilometers of distance. And to end, as always, it is always possible to extend iOS framework capabilities. Of course, using the Clairs, some of the open source projects that are available, and of course, third party plugins. You can find open source projects as this, one of them that is excellent, provided by Jeremy. So take a look at them and use them to extend uh, the IOS projects. So, questions? Anyone? Everything good? Great. So, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>